A.B. Crumpler was an evangelist in the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Crumpler was an advocate for teachings of personal holiness, opposed to things such as unscriptural divorce, dancing, and card playing. In 1897, he started an interdenominational association called the North Carolina Holiness Association. Crumpler left the Methodist Church and helped to start a church called Pentecostal Holiness Church in 1898, but the congregation shortly dissolved and Crumpler returned to the MEC South. He found himself in a denominational trial the following year, and although he did ultimately win the trial, he felt the writing was on the wall for the MEC South. Crumpler withdrew from the Methodists again and began a new organization called the Pentecostal Holiness Church of North Carolina. He called the Methodists the old theater-going, whiskey-drinking, card-playing, tobacco-using, secret lodge-loving, oyster-frying, ice-cream-supper-dancing church. Holiness teaching was controversial, not just denominationally, but within local communities. When a few churches had been founded, the ministers noticed that members, when asked, would say that they were part of the Pentecostal church and omit the word holiness to reduce the scorning of their new neighbors. As a result, in 1901, they removed the word Pentecostal from the denominational name, making it the Holiness Church of North Carolina. At this time, the term Pentecostal was used by holiness denominations and didn't mean what it means today. Charles Parham's teaching of of baptism in the Holy Spirit resulting in a necessary speaking in tongues would only begin in 1901, and the Azusa Street Revival was still in the future in 1906. However, when modern Pentecostalism did explode onto the scene, the Holiness Church of North Carolina embraced it. In 1908, they officially added Pentecostal theology into their Articles of Faith, and in 1909, they restored the word Pentecostal into the denominational name. Parallel to the rise of the Pentecostal Holiness Church was another denomination, the Fire Baptized Holiness Church. Benjamin Irwin, a formerly Baptist evangelist in Nebraska, had not only adopted Wesleyan holiness theology with its post-salvation sanctification experience, but also began teaching a third experience— baptism of fire following sanctification. The holiness movement mostly rejected this third blessing teaching, and so Irwin began to found fire baptized holiness associations that would uphold the theology, beginning with one in Iowa in 1895. In 1898, Irwin founded a national association, the Fire Baptized Holiness Association. In 1900, Irwin left the movement, and his replacement, General Overseer Joseph King, would in 1902 change the name to the Fire Baptized Holiness Church. When in 1906 Pentecostalism arose, it fit perfectly with the teaching of the church and was fully embraced. Following this, the Pentecostal Holiness Church of North Carolina and the Fire Baptized Holiness Church recognized that they were teaching the same things, and they sought to join together. On January 30, 1911, this took place. Although at the merger, the Fire Baptized Holiness Church was the larger of the two, the name chosen was the Pentecostal Holiness Church. In 1975, the church added the word international at the beginning of their name. The IPHC considers itself as affected by several Christian movements. In their manual, they refer to what they call the Lutheran Reformation and say, Martin Luther's doctrine of the believer's justification by faith alone was the most enduring contribution of the Protestant Reformation to Christian experience. This doctrine became the bedrock of the Reformation and remains the basic doctrinal foundation of all evangelical churches, including the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. Another influence they give is the Wesleyan Revival, of which it is said, the Methodist movement, begun by John Wesley in 18th century England, produced the second major contribution to the church's theology, the doctrine of sanctification as a second work of grace. In Pentecostal historiography, this is seen generally as the second spiritual reformation of the church. Then the holiness movement is mentioned and described. The last major holiness revival among the Methodists and other mainline Protestant churches came after the formation of the National Holiness Association in Vineland, New Jersey in 1867. But the resulting revival failed to bring the majority of the American church back to the holiness cause. When the Southern Methodist Church rejected the holiness movement in 1894, more than 25 new holiness groups dedicated to the promotion of holiness preaching and living formed in the United States. The Pentecostal Holiness Church was one of the groups begun after 1894 as a result of the controversies over the question of sanctification. Finally, the Pentecostal movement is listed as an influence. After describing the history of Pentecostalism, they state, the Pentecostal Holiness Church 
church was a part of this Pentecostal outpouring. From the beginning, it played a significant role in the unfolding drama of this third spiritual reformation of the church. Organized as a holiness group in 1898, the church officially incorporated the theology of the Pentecostal Reformation in its Articles of Faith in 1908. In the church's constitution, after the first article listing their name and second article describing their organizational form, the third article is the Apostles' Creed. In the Articles of Faith, the Church affirms the doctrine of the Trinity, that there is one God in three persons. Jesus, who is God the Son, took a human nature, was born of a virgin, he arose from the dead, and will return to judge at the last day. There is eternal life for the righteous and torture in hell for the wicked. The Constitution states that there are only two practices that clearly rise to the level of ordinances. These are water baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is not for infants, but only those who have professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is stated, All who unite with any local church on profession of faith in Christ should further confess Christ by receiving water baptism, preferably by immersion as early as possible. A Trinitarian formula is used. The 1911 Constitution created by the newly merged IPHC stated that the candidate shall have the right to choose whatever mode of baptism he prefers, allowing for sprinkling or pouring baptisms. Additionally, it is stated, Christian parents and guardians shall have liberty of conscience in the baptism of their children. By 1989, the manual no longer stated this, though there is no official policy prohibiting baptism by a mode other than immersion. The Lord's Supper is open to all Christians. The element of the cup is unfermented wine. It is observed at least quarterly. The Articles of Faith say that the Bible is composed of 66 books, and that it is verbally and plenarily inspired, the Word of God, and the full and complete revelation of the plan and history of redemption. It is inerrant and authoritative. On creation and evolution, beyond affirming God as the creator, the IPHC has no requirements that churches teach any particular viewpoint. On original sin, the IPHC constitution says every human being was potentially created with Adam and put into the body or materiality as he was. As he fell, all fell in him and with him. They also say that Christ died for our personal transgressions and also for original sin. On salvation, the eighth of the Church's Articles of Faith says, We believe, teach, and firmly maintain the scriptural doctrine of justification by faith alone. Good works don't contribute to justification or salvation. Good works are a product of salvation, however. The IPHC website has a template for people to gather thoughts to share their salvation testimony with others. It includes three parts. When you were lost, jot down notes about your condition before you met Jesus. These could be things you experienced, circumstances, or emotions you felt. When you were found, write out thoughts about what happened when Jesus met you in your sin and brokenness and how he saved you. When you were free, explain how your thoughts, mind, heart, relationships, and life changed when you became free through Jesus Christ. General Superintendent Doug Beecham said in 2015, the IPHC holds to an Arminian Wesleyan perspective. And in 2017, from Wesley, we have our Arminian understanding of God's saving grace, predestination, election, and human response. Part of the Arminian view is that a person once saved can fall from grace and be in an unsaved condition again. Of sanctification, the church's articles of faith state, We believe in sanctification. While sanctification is initiated in regeneration and consummated in glorification, we believe it includes a definite, instantaneous work of grace achieved by faith subsequent to regeneration. Sanctification delivers from the power and dominion of sin. It is followed by lifelong growth in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Christ. Later in the Constitution, it is also expounded that Christ shed his blood for complete cleansing of the justified believer from all indwelling sin and its pollution, something that takes place after regeneration. It is also stated it is not absolute perfection, not angelic perfection, not sinless perfection, if the term is used to imply the impossibility of a sanctified person's falling into sin. We do not believe it is impossible for the sanctified to commit sin, but we do believe it is possible for a sanctified person not to commit sin. As stated earlier, though at its founding, the Pentecostal Holiness Church, which would become the IPHC, was not Pentecostal. In 1908, the denomination wholly adopted Pentecostal theology and added the following statement into their Articles of Faith, which remains today. We believe the Pentecostal baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire is obtainable by a definite act of appropriating faith on the part of the fully cleansed believer, and the initial evidence of the reception of this experience is speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. They also state, 
We believe, because the Bible teaches and requires it, that to receive the baptism with the Holy Ghost, a person must have a clean heart and life as a prerequisite for this great blessing. Every person baptized with the Holy Spirit speaks in tongues. There is also a separate gift of tongues, which not every believer has. The Twelfth Article of Faith says, We believe in divine healing as in the atonement. Like many Pentecostal denominations in the early 1900s, the Pentecostal Holiness Church originally emphasized divine healing often to the point of rejection of much of modern medicine and treatment under the care of doctors. A minority of ministers in the church were opposed to this teaching, believing that the Pentecostal emphasis on divine healing was still compatible with the use of doctors and medical treatment. In 1921, these split off and formed another denomination, the Congregational Holiness Church. As their name implies, they also chose a different polity structure, being congregationally governed. Additionally, they practice feet washing as an ordinance of the church, and they have around 275 congregations. Today, the IPHC says in their constitution, while we do not condemn the use of medical means in the treatment of physical disease, we do believe in, practice, and commend to our people the laying on of hands by the elders or leaders of the church, the anointing with oil in the name of the Lord, and the offering of prayers for the healing of the sick. In the introduction to the IPHC manual, it is stated, We are committed to the mission of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in the church today, and seek to minister in the power of these Christ-given gifts. On apostleship in the church's apostolic position paper, they distinguish between the foundational apostles and functional apostles. Foundational apostles saw Jesus, wrote New Testament scripture, and are no longer around today. Functional apostles can exist today and have a level of anointing and power for ministry unique to this calling. They say, at this level it is reasonable to believe the ministry gift of the apostle has always existed in the Lord's church and continues to this day. They also state, no modern day apostle or prophet can write or speak words that are equal to God's word as recorded in the Holy Bible. On eschatology or end times, the 13th article of faith states, We believe in the imminent, personal, premillennial second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and love and wait for his appearing. Further, the Constitution clarifies the denomination's teaching of a pre-tribulation rapture and a two-stage coming of Christ. On the family, the Constitution says that marriage is between one man and one woman and that the husband is the head of the home. It also states that they maintain a strong biblical position against premarital extramarital and deviant sex, including homosexual and lesbian relationships, and all forms of child molestation and or exploitation. Yet, we rejoice that people bound by these sins can find hope and deliverance in the gospel. The Constitution says, The prophet Malachi recorded the heart of God when he wrote, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel, Malachi 2.16. However, this passionate prophetic description does not justify the conclusion that God hates divorced people. To the contrary, he never stops loving them. Requirements are listed for a person who is divorced and remarried who wants ministry credentials. They will only be considered if their former spouse died or remarried, if the remarriage was prior to conversion, if the former spouse was sexually immoral and unwilling to repent, or if the partner willingly and permanently deserted the believing spouse. The Constitution states we affirm every person's right to life and maintain a strong position against abortion and euthanasia, both of which undermine the biblical sanctity of life. We oppose human cloning. As a denomination with a focus on holiness, the IPHC has, in their Constitution, a covenant of commitment with guidelines on ways for members to practice holiness in their lives. They are to avoid all evils in modern society designed to weaken or destroy their spirituality, including carefully judging the television, movie, music, computer, computer, and internet industries, and not viewing pornography. They state, We reject the loose moral values of our culture and encourage our young people, as well as our adults, to choose clothing that will honor their bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. Church worship style can vary from upbeat hymn singing or singing along with a dressed-up church choir to fully contemporary worship with praise bands. In some IPHC churches, most women will wear skirts or dresses, but in others, this is not the case. Members are to abstain from alcohol, tobacco, and addictive drugs. Members are responsible to give tithes, that is, a tenth of their income to the church, and encouraged to give offerings beyond that. According to the IPHC bylaws, only members who have faithfully been giving tithes in the previous six months are eligible to vote in church business meetings. IPHC churches send what is called a church tithe, 10% of their income to the church's regional conference. Ministers do not give their tithe to the local church, but directly to the conference. 
Conferences forward 55% of church ties to the general treasury of the denomination. According to the church's constitution, the International Pentecostal Holiness Church, Inc. shall be a connectional church with an Episcopal form of government. A general conference is held every four years. Those who may vote in the general conference include but are not limited to the Council of Bishops, senior pastors, chaplains, ordained and licensed clergy, whether active or retired, and the spouses of those listed. Additionally, member churches may send delegates to the conference, one delegate for every 50 members. A church that doesn't comply with the church tithe may not send delegates. When the general conference is not in session, the Council of Bishops is the highest authority of the church. There's a general superintendent who is the primary vision caster for the church. In the U.S., the IPHC is divided into conferences, and there are international regions as well. Each conference has a superintendent or bishop and executive council. Local churches have an administrative council, and the conference executive council appoints senior pastors to churches after consultation with the administrative council. Optionally, a church-wide election may take place as well. Church administrative councils may conduct their own pastoral search in cooperation with the conference superintendent. The denomination holds rights to the property of local congregations. On ministerial credentials, the IPHC says, When leadership has determined that a person has been called by God to do the work of the ministry, the IPHC affirms that calling through the following credentials. Minister's License, Certificate of Ordination. These credentials permit a minister to mature in the God-given gift mix. This may include apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, as well as any other combination of the manifold gifts of the Spirit. We hold these to be ministry gifts of the Holy Spirit, therefore, and not titles to be conferred by the IPHC. Local churches have senior pastors. They may have additional associate pastors under the senior pastor. Congregations also have local church elders who serve on the administrative council and deacons who have a ministry of service to the local church. They are not necessarily on the administrative council, but they may be elected to it. Licensed and ordained IPHC ministers may serve as senior pastors of non-IPHC churches if their conference executive council permits it. In its 2015 position paper on women in ministry, the IPHC said, From its beginning over a hundred years ago, the International Pentecostal Holiness Church, IPHC, has licensed and ordained women for ministry in its churches, including the pastorate, as well as for leadership in its conferences and denominational positions. In September 1996, the IPHC convened a solemn assembly to address seven specific sins of the church's past. One of those was male domination, whereby the church repented of patterns of resistance to women in ministry. In September 2021, the first woman bishop in Africa was elected. The IPHC is part of several associations. These include Christian Churches Together, the National Association of Evangelicals, Pentecostal Charismatic Churches of North America, and Pentecostal World Fellowship. The IPHC manual states that at the close of 2016, the IPHC had more than 3.8 million adherents who attend 18,079 churches located around the globe, and then clarifies these as 12,437 IPHC churches with 1.7 million adherents and 5,642 affiliate churches with 2.1 million adherents. In the U.S., they claim 1.5 million members in 1,600 congregations. There are four higher education institutions institutions affiliated with the IPHC in the U.S., Advantage College, Emmanuel College, Holmes Bible College, and Southwestern Christian University. Denominations of all kinds are discussed here at Ready to Harvest. Subscribe for more informative videos.